What's up, y'all? Welcome to the Young Legends Podcast, where we help you get the cheat codes to the game of life. I'm your host, Caption, aka Caption Red, and we have the most amazing guest today, Mr. Cam Awesome. Cam Awesome is a well known youth speaker and personality. He is an Emmy nominated six time USA national boxing champion, two time Olympic trials heavyweight champion and former captain of the USA national boxing team. Cam has been featured in several media outlets, including ESPN, The Washington Post, Rolling Stone Magazine, SI.com, and many others. Cam shares lessons he has learned from boxing with students across the country using humor and interactive activities. Cam, thank you so much for joining me today. How are you doing today, man? Doing great, doing great. Thanks for having me. Oh, man, this is great. I'm so excited about uh, interviewing you and just learning so many things from you. And yeah, man, I mean, you've, you're so accomplished and you, I'm sure you have tons of stories. And I always like to start my episode off or my interview off with a cool story or a fun story. Uh, would you like to share a story with myself and my audience? Yeah, one thing I learned in through public speaking is people aren't too interested in your stories where you're just awesome all the time. So uh, I guess I'll share a story the first time I, I did a comedy show. Like I, I had started comedy in probably like 2012. And the way it kind of works is you, you go to open mics and I did a, quite a few open mics. And when you do shows, they basically, they basically, it doesn't matter how good you are as long as you can sell tickets. And being that I wasn't accomplished in comedy in any means necessary, but I had some boxing fans, I could sell tickets. So they put me on a show and basically they gave you as, as much time as people, as you brought. And I packed out the show. So they're like, take as much time as you want, which at this point I had maybe, if I'm being honest with myself, maybe a solid four minutes of material. And I'm like, all right, light me at 25. <laughs> which I didn't even know the term light me at the time, but I was like, yeah, I'll just do like 25 minutes. And I get there and I do like my opening joke, which like kills, but that's when I noticed like the difference between like the hole in the wall bars I was doing open mics at and an actual comedy stage. Like the lights are in your face and you can't see anyone besides the first row. And that's why that's who people usually get picked on. And I saw that. Like I, I did the joke, I looked up, I saw the bright lights and I, I j- 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 just froze mm. and started stuttering. And, and I, I'm like sweating profusely and out of a panic, I just reach in my pocket and take out my phone and just start reading jokes out of my phone, verbatim, out of context, like with no good timing. Ouch. And I'm just... Two and a half minutes into it, I'm just bombing. But I have very supportive friends and they know it's my first comedy show. So they're just like applauding over and over and like high enthusiasm. So I'm like, maybe I'm killing. So I just (laughs) continue this completely zoned out and I continue on. And it it becomes clear that I am bombing. And I look up and I realize like someone is waving their cell phone at me and i didn't know that that means get off the stage but because no one told me at that point i've been doing comedy for like a few weeks so what ended up happening was they got all the comics from the back because they didn't want to come off stage and remove physically remove the giant boxer Mm -hmm. so all the comics in the back like get together in the back of the room and start waving their phones for me to get off stage and i also didn't notice that but my friends did. And that was like 75% of the crowd. So at this point, like everyone in the room is waving their cell phones back and forth <laughs> for me to get off stage. And at that moment, I think I'm like, it's like a rock show. I must be killing it. <laughs> and I didn't. Luckily, there's no footage of that, probably because everybody was waving their cell phones for me uh... to get off stage instead of recording it. Uh, <laughs> that was a. Uh, probably one of the worst experiences I've ever had on a stage. Oh man. That's, uh, that's awesome, man. (laughs) Gosh. Uh, I bet y'all laugh about it today. You and your friends, right? (laughs) 
Oh, they still make fun of me about it. <laughs> That's great, man. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> yeah, I uh, no, I, I can relate though, man. I've I've uh, I've been on the comedy stage and I've I bombed myself a few times, and the first time it just su- you, you understand just sucks because you're like, hold on, I thought I was good. What's going on? Here? <laughs> uh, you you'll you'll get off stage like after killing. You're like, this is what I'm gonna do with my life. I'm not doing anything else. This is my calling. And then the like two hours later, the second show of the night, you get off stage. You're like, I, I need to go back to community college. I need to like get my life together. It's like <laughs> there you go. Ups and downs. Yeah, absolutely. Go uh, revisit your guidance counselor from high school and. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. great. That's great. Um, cool, man. I love that story. That's a that's a great one. Now, you do so many things. Uh, you you're, you get your uh, your hand in a lot of things, and you're you're doing great in a lot of things. I, I do want to know. I don't even know which origin story to start with, but I want to hear the the boxing origin story because I think that is uh, one that. Uh, the audience would like to hear, but I'd also like to hear about comedy. But let's start with boxing first. How did you get into boxing? Uh, well, I had a pretty unhealthy relationship with food my entire life growing up. And I always struggled with weight and I was overweight. And my senior year in high school, I decided to join a, a gym to lose weight. And actually in hopes of getting a prom date. Mm. <laughs> but that didn't work out. <laughs> but uh, the only free gym in the, in the neighborhood was a boxing gym. And although I've never boxed and never was never a fan of boxing didn't even like the sport uh i like free stuff so i decided to uh to join the boxing gym and after i lost all the weight i uh, decided to have one boxing match as like a gift to myself and i didn't tell my family i didn't tell anyone i just did it and i won and i'd never won anything before because i never made a team before and i realized i like winning and uh, decided to continue chasing that high. So I just just continued boxing. I didn't really have a life plan of what I was going to do. So I was just like, oh, I'll just box until I figure it out. And that was many years ago. So I, I within my first two years, I won the 2008 Olympic trials and uh, lost in the Olympic trials, continued boxing. I won nationals in uh, pretty much every year up to 2012. Uh, won the Olympic trials in 2012. And then was suspended, kicked off the Olympic team for not filling out my drug testing paperwork, left the country. Yeah, I left the country uh, to fight in a tournament, a tournament you have to get drug tested to to fight in. But I forgot to email them to tell them I was leaving the country. So they showed up to my house to give me a random drug test, missed drug tests, a positive drug test, got suspended for a positive drug test. I got the minimum uh, sentence a year, which they knew I got tested that same week and I wasn't doing anything uh, illegal. It was just my negligence. So I had to, I was forced to take a year off from boxing and lost my number one spot, lost a chance to go to the 2012 Olympics. Went, went through some depression, gained a lot of weight again, uh, which is pretty common for me. And lost a bet, had to be vegan for 28 days. Mm. And that diet also entailed sobriety. So that's what like got me sober and lost a bunch of weight in the 28 days and decided I didn't like the negative person I became. Uh, so I did what enough adults don't take advantage of. Went to City Hall and uh, symbolically killed off the old me by legally changing my name on yes. my half birthday. Yeah, that's awesome, man. It literally says that on your uh, driver's license and all your paperwork now, right? Yeah, birth certificate, uh, passport, all everything. Wow, that's awesome, man. Yeah, so I changed the name and decided to return to boxing. And won nationals, 13, 14, 15, 2016, won the Olympic trials, but then lost in the international qualifier. uh, And I wasn't able to make it to Rio. That was on July 4th, 2016. That day, like I made a post on social media and said I was going to reinvent, reinvent myself and possibly pursue speaking where I'm at now. (laughs) No, that's great, man. And and you're killing it. You're out there spreading a really positive message um and i've watched your videos it's it's really awesome to see you just dominating that arena as well so uh tell us a a little bit about your uh speaking business uh well i named it awesome talks because uh figured it'd be catchy and uh i like slogans and stuff so it's words that pack a punch but 
I originally, first thing I spoke on was bullying because that was kind of near and dear to me since I dealt with bullying, uh, which also, I guess, transitioned into cyberbullying and digital awareness. Uh, so I, right now I speak on bullying, physical, verbal, cyber exclusionary, uh, and roasting. Uh, I'll speak on the long-term social media and the potential long-term effects of a, a digital footprint can have on future team schools and employers, goal setting and the resilience necessary to achieve said goals, and uh, the new epidemic of vaping, which I still don't really understand. Like, I feel old because growing up, we just made fun of people who vape, and now kids think it's something cool. It's so odd. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's, yeah, it's literally killing people and you know wreaking havoc all over people's lives. So uh, that's awesome that you're doing that. So where do you speak at as far as your speeches go? Are you so uh, actually my first my first like speaking tour I decided to go on. I planned it out. It took forever to plan it. It was going to be 51 days. Planned everything out. Got my routes out. Booked hotels. Backup battery, backup cash, nothing could go wrong. If you want to make God laugh, tell him you have a plan. So took off at 11 a.m. And three hours into it, totaled my car. Oh, no. Uh, yeah, totaled my, my Prius. Uh, her name was White Fiber. White because of the color of the car. Fiber because fiber is a good source for gas and so are Priuses. Boom. Right. I think everyone should name <laughs> nice. their cars. There you uh, go. So I... Uh, I figured it'd be kind of ironic if I were to quit three hours into it. So mm -hmm. I just made my way to a rental center, uh, rented a car, got everything out of my total car, put in my rental car and just continued on with the tour. Uh, fun fact, when you rent a car that same day, it's more expensive. And when you're trying to return it out of state, it's, uh, it's even more expensive. So I ended up in the red for that tour, that 51 day tour. Oh no. Car. Yeah. But, uh, I did learn a lot from it, and what what came of it was I needed to buy a vehicle, and someone jokingly said, "You're a motivational speaker. You should like live in a van down by the river," which is like a Saturday Night Live Chris Farley skit. And I was like, "That's actually brilliant." So I bought a 2006 Dodge Sprinter, furnished it up, and uh, I've just been living out out of my van for the last year and a half. And I visit schools all around the country. That's amazing. You literally took that to the, <laughs> I didn't realize you're, uh, I thought it was just a vehicle, but you were living out of the van as you were doing your speeches. That's awesome. Oh yeah. 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 It's got, uh, I got a, I got Wi-Fi. I got a coffee maker, microwave, 16 gallon water tank, got a pull out bed, which turns to a couch. Mm. I got a folding chair and a little office desk that, that's like retractable. So I save money from hotels, flights, rental cars, and plan a fitness membership to shower and work out. So, I mean, you learn how much you don't need in life because the first thing I had to do was like, realize what do I take with me? Mm -hmm. You don't need anything really. The idea of like a minimalist lifestyle is probably the greatest lifestyle there is. People have so much junk in their lives and they're so stressed out to pay for things that they don't even need. I wish people, more people would could, could see the benefit in that. Yeah, absolutely. That's uh, yeah. I mean, it's it's a uh, kind of timely because this will come out, you know, right before the Christmas shopping comes. So <laughs> I'm glad that you're the the voice of reason. Uh, oh, yeah. I don't I don't do obligatory obligatory holidays like there you go. Christmas. Uh, I just do holidays where you dress up for. Yeah, I'll do Halloween, go. Cinco de Mayo, St. Patrick's Day, which I guess now was is that like cultural appropriation now? I don't know. Yeah, I think I think you're okay on the St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> yeah. I think you're okay. I don't I don't think there's gonna be a bunch of uh, Irish people trying to fight you in the streets. Uh, well, maybe they'll be trying to fight me, but yeah. <laughs> the fighting Irish. Yes, indeed. That's awesome, man. Very cool. So, wow, man. Uh, lo tell me about the how you got into comedy because I know that you you started, but that was it. Just something that you just had a, a inkling for. Or? Uh, my friend and I would go to, to free comedy night and everyone was just terrible. And I was just thinking like, I could do better than this, but I also don't like when people say like, I could do better than that. And they don't actually try because it's real easy to say you can do something, but it's, first of all, it's terrifying 
to actually step out of your comfort zone and do something you're not sure you know how to do. And it'll also allow you to gain respect for what other people do. Uh, I didn't realize that free comedy night was just open mic night. And that's where everyone goes to try out their jokes. So I actually went to open mic night and uh, began doing comedy that way. And you now I, I got a better response than normal comics just because like they don't book you on how funny you are. They book you on how many tickets you can sell. And I can usually sell tickets in any city. So when I reach, let's say I'm speaking in New Jersey, or let's say I'm speaking in New York, I'll reach out to like a comedy club in New York and say, hey, I'm out there, uh, like to do a show on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And uh, you don't have to pay for my travel, I'll already be there. So that way I get to do comedy in different cities and it's something to do in the evenings. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you're still to some degree competitive boxing, is that correct? Or uh, Yeah, yeah, I was going to, uh, I said that I was gonna, July 4th, 2016, I was going to stop boxing and pursue public speaking. And after realizing that I could do both, I wanted to make a run for the 2020 Tokyo Olympics. And then speaking blew up, drove last year's last school year, I drove 54,000 miles, spoke at over 100 schools. And every life was just so busy that I just kind of dropped the idea of boxing. And in August, I was listening to the Joe Rogan podcast. And he was talking about motivational speakers and how most of them should stop doing motivational speaking because they're not even motivated themselves and not doing anything, but talking about motivation. And I kind of felt like he was talking to me and I felt, felt I was bothered by it because there's, there's truth. Kind of struck a chord. And I felt like I quit all my goals and all I was doing was talking about what I used to do. So that kind of, kind of lit a fire under me. So in August, I started preparing for, for what I'm doing now. So I was booking a bunch of gigs, but I was also working out twice a day, uh, was going to different, di different gyms and different cities. I was boxing, I was speaking in to get boxing workouts in. And because my dad is a citizen of Trinidad and Tobago, I uh, decided to fight for the Trinidad and Tobago Olympic team instead of the USA Olympic team. Sunday night, I was in Trinidad and I fought in their Olympic trials finals and I won by second round knockout. So as of now, I'm training for the 2020 Olympic team for Trinidad and Tobago. That's awesome, man. That's uh, dang. <laughs> <laughs> just, the, just the idea of, of doing everything and, and going to the Olympics. I, I mentally can't fathom it, but you're, you're making it happen. So that's really cool. Yeah. I'm hoping it works out. It's, it's, it's taught me to prioritize a lot. I realized that Doing the van life, I was I didn't care about how many gigs I booked. I, I actually booked a lot, but it wasn't about the money. I just wanted to go to different cities, try different vegan restaurants in different cities, and and now I'm I'm a little more efficient with it, building a schedule uh, in advance and reaching out to multiple schools within the district at once because I'm not trying to live on the road speaking anymore. So I have to live in the gym training. So, right, absolutely. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Well, it's inspiring nonetheless. Now, um, speaking of your fighting career, what are some important life lessons that you learned through boxing? Oftentimes you hear people say, you know, sport is just a great teacher of life. So what are what are the things that you learned that you didn't know going in as a 17, 18 year old that just really helped you dominate in boxing and just in life overall? First thing I would say that I learned was growing up, I thought big people knew what was going on. Like when I'm a kid, I thought older people, like I listened to them because they're older, they know what's going on. And as I got older, I realized no one knows what they're doing. Like, <laughs> yeah, right. No one knows. Some people get lucky. Of course, skill and hard work's evolved, but also nothing is real. It's all the illusion. No one knows what they're doing. To prove that, I don't know what I'm doing. And I'm talking to kids about what, to be, what they should be doing. Granted, I'm pointing them in the right direction, but there's so many variables in life that there's no right way to do something. But there are a lot of wrong ways. Sure. So uh, and I do believe that boxing is the greatest metaphor for life because everyone's fighting their own internal battles. And the three greatest lessons I learned from boxing, which I speak about in my presentations, is hard work, 
because I didn't know what hard work was until I got punched in the face for not working hard enough. Small details and how everyone focuses on the big picture, but it's the actual small details that will get you a lot further in life. And uh, resilience. If you can fail without being discouraged, success becomes inevitable. Those are the three greatest things I've taken from boxing. That's great, man. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. All three of those things is, uh, are, are just very, very important. And uh, particularly the resilience thing. I mean, it's all important, but oftentimes people just give up or they, they allow things to uh, just take them down further than it should. It's okay to be knocked down, but yeah. staying knocked down is just a, a different story, right? Yeah. And I, I've, I've witnessed so many people come around and fall short of their goals and just accept it, which I don't have that in me. All right. And I think that's a lot why a lot of people like post about what they're going to do. Like everyone talks about what they're going to do, what they're going to do, because it's easier to talk about what you're going to do than what you've done. That's sure. kind of the reason why I kept this whole Olympic run to myself since August. Because of course I could post about it like this is what I'm doing, this is what I'm gonna be doing next. But I feel like everyone could do that. There's nothing special in that. So I kind of just kept my head down, kept to myself, worked out twice a day, did the speaking, built the business, and I just officially announced it yesterday when Yahoo uh, Yahoo Sports released an article about it. Yeah, yeah, that's uh that's awesome, man. And what what is that phrase? The talk is cheap is the phrase, but it's actually free. <laughs> yeah talk is free yeah, yeah. unless unless you, you're booking me right. i got a fee. <laughs> exactly that's good man that's good um i, I want to backtrack to you being uh, a senior in high school to two years later winning um on a high level how did you go from you know never boxing before to now being a 20 year old champion Especially considering you said that you you hadn't won anything before, so you know I was expecting you to say, and yeah, I, uh, you know I uh, was a freshman quarterback on the varsity and this, that, and the other, and I'd be like, oh yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I think that one of the problems I went to a very large high school and middle school, and so many people try out for the teams, and I never got a chance to even make the team to show that I could work hard because there's so much competition, and you know a lot of the kids were in like little league and rec leagues growing up like i didn't know any of the rules of football when i tried out in, in middle school so i didn't have a great advantage and the cool thing about boxing is there's no team to make and you are just going to be as good as you allow yourself to be and as long as you work harder than everyone else you'll be better than everyone else so that's the kind of the uh, approach i took to it that's awesome. And what exactly did that look like? Because other people are training. So would it be like staying late? Would it be, you know, eating your egg yolks in the morning? Like what, what, what did you, what was that like doing the extra? Like, I don't know. I don't know if I'm getting too technical. But... Oh, no, no, no. Like the thing I believe that separated me was I would just literally work out as hard as physically possible all of the time. I didn't hang out with anyone. I didn't have any friends. If you wanted to hang out with me, we're going to work out. If you don't want to work out with me, I don't want to hang out with you. I didn't do birthdays. I didn't go to Christmas vacation with families. I didn't do anything. I literally obsessed over boxing because I figured if I obsessed over it and I literally did everything in my power to where I know if I lost, there's literally nothing else I could have done. If you train that hard and prepare that hard, when it gets a little tough during the fight or you get a little tired, you mentally don't allow yourself to lose. Mm. And I would enter the ring with the confidence that I was going to win because I put all the work in. So I trained like I thought I was a loser and I walked in the ring like I was a king. And I genuinely believed that it's just procedural where I have to show up, make weight, the ref has to get in the ring, I have to get in the ring, my opponent has to get in the ring. And then we have to fight, but we're all doing this because we all know that I'm going to win. Nice. It sounds cocky, but I genuinely, that's my approach to it. And I know a lot of people who work out really hard. They're in great shape. 
but they don't have the mental toughness. And there's some people who have the mental toughness, but don't have the athletic ability. And those people are the ones who like brag about being able to take a punch. That's not my MO. I don't want to get hit. Sure. Like I'm so terrified of being hit. You'd be surprised that I'm even boxing. Very cool. So tell me about this whole, you said that bullying is near and dear to your heart. Uh, it sounds like you've gone through bullying. I know that Mike Tyson did. You, you'd be surprised how many people get bullied through their life uh, that you feel like who would ever bully that person. But uh, it sounds like you've experienced that. So would you like to just uh, tell a little bit about that and maybe give some advice to people who are going through it right now? Yeah, uh, my deal was I wasn't a very aggressive kid. I didn't like to play in dirt or any of that. I had two sisters. I jump rope, I double dutch, I can braid. Like, <laughs> nice. I, I didn't have any male figures in my life. And that was easily spotted out when I was at school. Like, I had a lot of feminine mannerisms. And like, even I remember uh, middle school when we like had to take showers in middle school for the first time, I used to put my towel like right below my neck, like put it across my whole chest because all of the females I've ever seen, like everyone I've ever seen, that's where they put their towels. Sure. But like guys put it around their waist. That was like the first thing I remember being mocked for in like middle school. And kids pick on the weak kids. So I was, I was very non-confrontational and people could sense that. And that's why people would just provoke me. Uh, and, and I figured once I learned how to fight, I just want to beat everyone up. But I realized once you learn how to fight and you have the confidence of a person who knows how to fight and other people know you how to fight, you know how to fight, you don't have to fight. Right. So I believe that kids are being bullied. I think they should all sign up for boxing. They don't have to fight. They don't have to spar. They don't have to get hit. I just believe the workout alone and knowing how to throw a punch and being in the gym will give a kid confidence. And whether or not he ever punches a person all the other kids in school are like, oh, he's a he's a boxer. Don't mess with him. And that will get him left alone, him or her left alone. Yeah, absolutely. So going back to uh, what you would uh, do if you were a, a young person being bullied, what is something that you wish you had known growing up that has really revolutionized your life? Like me, myself, like I, I had a really big nose growing up and I didn't realize my face was going to grow into it one day. And that uh, <laughs> it, it actually, it's an asset, not a liability like it used to be. So I would say the, the big thing for me was no one cares. Mm. I wish I would have known that no one cares. Every day I went to school, like, and I didn't know anxiety was a thing, but I suffered from it. Like to the point where I, middle school, high school, I always volunteered in the nurse's office during my lunch hour because I got my lunch first. I didn't have to be in the, in the large lunchroom with all the kids, everyone's talking. And it freaked me out. I didn't know anxiety was a thing back then, but like I had anxiety and I knew everyone was always looking at me and, and judging what I'm wearing and like critiquing me. And if I wore the same shirt on Monday that I wore on Thursday, like people would know. And then I grew up and I realized literally no one even knew I existed. Like, Everyone's so worried about themselves in school. If I went to my 10-year reunion, which I didn't, no one would even know who I was. I made what other people thought of me such a significant part of my life, and I wasn't a significant part of theirs. And instead of enjoying my childhood, I was just paranoid all the time. And I think a lot of kids are doing that, and especially since the age of social media and likes and everyone wants to be relevant. And if you think you're relevant, it also doesn't help. I, I wish I would have known like no one cares that I'm wearing the same shirt today that I wore three days ago. Yeah, absolutely. It's funny. Yeah. We're so self-conscious <laughs> when you're young, you're just like, Oh my gosh, like what are people going to think? That was a, that was a thought that ran through my head a lot when I was a teenager. What are people going to think? And yeah. they're not <laughs> yeah. they're not, gonna think. Um, not at all. That's awesome, man. 
Uh, speaking of which, have you have you run into some people that you grew up with? Uh, what's that like? You know, now that you're the, just this accomplished boxer and <laughs> you know you're a speaker. I mean, like you're you're winning in so many categories. I feel yeah. like that interaction must be a, a very interesting one. Uh, I, I actually, I don't see too many people from my childhood. I actually went to spoken. I was Philadelphia. Well, I spoke in New Jersey. It was right across the, the bridge from Philadelphia. And on Facebook, it showed that like one of my, one of the few people I, I spoke to in high school was in town and I hit her up and we went out, went out for dinner. And she's like, reminded me a bunch of things about high school that I like completely like blacked out of my memory. Like I uh, got beat up by a girl in ninth grade. Totally wow. forgot about that. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I didn't win that fight. Yeah, I'm sure she doesn't want to rematch though, right? <laughs> <laughs> I've been training for. <laughs> <laughs> that's wild, man. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's funny. I bet she's seen you on TV or something and just been like, "Whoa!" Uh, I we we're trying to remember her name. I wish I could. <laughs> that's wild, man. That's yeah. uh, yeah. It, well, it must be nice, anyways, just knowing, you know, when you do run into whoever it is. It's going to be like, not that I'm throwing this in your face, but I am successful. (laughs) I'm not afraid of you anymore. Exactly. That's awesome, man. Okay. So besides the uh, missing your drug tests and and going up and doing comedy when you shouldn't have, you know, attempted a whole (laughs) half hour comedy special all by yourself. Are there any other mistakes that you learned through life that you wish you had, you know, just mistakes that you learned that helped you to learn about life that you feel like everyone in the world should know? Yeah. You're not going to learn anything in your comfort zone. And Mm. I used to get jealous. And now I used to get upset at people who are good at things. Like if you're good at basketball, I'm like, man, you're lucky you're good at basketball. You're lucky you're born good at basketball. Because I genuinely thought people were just born good at stuff. And I didn't realize you got good at stuff from sucking for a long time. Like, I bet if you listen to like one of your early raps, you just cringe. Oh, you like, have no idea. <laughs> yes. That that's like I wish I would have would have known. Like, all you have to do is just suck at something long enough to not suck at it. And that's why, like anything that I pick up now, I put my all into everything I do. But I also realize that. I'm going to suck for a while. And I kind of train myself to be ignorant of my ability. Like mm. I've done, I've done like speeches where like when I first started, I have done speech where I got off stage. I'm happy. I'm hyped. You see me and you know, like I just killed like Madison Square Garden, mm. huge crowd, like on a high. But if you watched it, you were like, he did terrible. Right. Just no sense of like, realization no i don't because having a sense of realization is not going to help anything i being hard on myself that i suck i'm like i've been doing it less than a year the only thing i could do is improve but a lot of people just see that they're failing at something and they kind of just drop it and i just figured i just will act like i don't suck yeah no that's good man that's uh that's awesome. <laughs> you know, it's funny that you said that because my first speech, I, I did the exact same thing. <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh, this is where the legend starts or something like that. Yeah. That, thought, that thought ran through my head. And then I got the reality email back from uh, one of the assistant principals that hired me. So I, I understand. <laughs> what was that email like? Oh, it was just like, you know, here are you know things that you should – you should have worked on or done better on that kind of thing. Um, and you know, it's, it's all good. It's just one big learning process. Um, you know, the thing that you do. Yeah. Don't do any of that. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome, man. Yeah, indeed. That's funny. Uh, uh, you you should see the smile on my face right now. (laughs) It's real. Um, very cool. So, what are uh, is there any life hacks that you've learned that kind of just made things move faster? Obviously, you know you have to do the repetitions and comedy and speaking and 
and working out for boxing. But was there anything that really just helped you, whether it was like a mindset life hack or just any other hack that you were just like, whoa, man, this uh, this is super helpful and, and bringing me closer to my goal faster? Uh, I would say definitely a mentor. Mm. I yep. accidentally stumbled into a mentor. Like this guy, Kerry Phillips, he's – uh, he's a great speaker. He's with the National Speaker Association, super accomplished, very humble. And he he thought it was cool that I was boxing. And he has this thing he calls the coffice, where he has an office. He has an office. In his, he has a, a, like a, a building office. He has an office in his home, but he spends 99% of his day at the coffee shop. He works from the coffee shop. And it's just like, it's, he calls it his caucus. And I would meet him there. Like every day I would meet him there and we just talk about the speaking world and give me insight and his opinion. And I take notes when I meet people. That's another life hack. Mm-hmm. Like every time I meet someone, I go on my phone under my folders, under notes, and I, it's labeled meet me. And next to it is uh, everybody I've ever had a meeting with. When I talk to you, I have my phone in my hand because I'm taking notes. You tell me a book to read. I'm writing it down. I'm writing the name of the person that told me to read the book, the date we met. And like Kerry Phillips, his list is the longest on my uh, meet with list. And if I look far back enough, you're on my, uh, you're on that list too. Oh man. Thanks. Yeah. Like, cause you learn different things from other people, from different people. And one thing I hate is if I ask, if you ask me advice, you're like, Oh, how do I get started speaking? And I say, do this, this, and that first. And you come back and ask me the same question in three months, you're just wasting my time. Sure. It, my fear is that if you tell me to do something, like if I ask you your advice and you tell me what to do, my fear is running into you before I get it done. Sure. Because like, I, I, I wouldn't want you to waste my time and I, I wouldn't waste your time. So I meet with people, I take notes and like I start, it's on the same, same notes page and like Carrie Phillips, every time we meet, I'm like, all right, March 11th. I'll look at notes now. Like uh, last time I met with Carrie, May 31st. All the notes from then before then was May 31st, April 3rd, January 30th. Every every time I met with him, I have all these notes. And I think that people should take notes, like organize them and follow through with it. Yeah. I don't think enough people do that. No, that's great. Yeah, the, you're the second uh, interview interviewee that has uh, said that. So uh, you got to take that home to the bank. Um, yeah, and list. I'm big on lists. Like I, I have a, I have a few different lists. One, one of my lists is basically everything I have to do, everything I need to get done, like short term. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I literally write literally everything I have to do to even cutting my nails everything I need to do on that list. And every time I accomplish something off of that list, I put a smiley face emoji next to it. Nice. And at the end of the day, I get to look at all the things I have accomplished. And if I look and there's not much accomplished on the list, I feel terrible about myself. And whatever's on that list, the first thing on that list is the last thing from yesterday. So I try not to leave, I try not to leave the things I don't want to do last because then I have to do it first the next day. Oh yeah. No, that's good. Very cool. Yeah, making making the list is uh the smiley face emoji. That is definitely a hack because that's like you know you look at it and there's some dopamine release. I'm sure. Oh man, I get I. That's why I put every little thing. And I was like, should I put every little thing? Yeah, yeah, I should because you get to look back at what you've done. Sure. Absolutely, man. That's good. Very cool. I I want to uh, go back to the the first part of what you just said, the mentorship is absolute gold. And I always tell young people like anywhere you want to go, someone else has already been there and they can show you what to do and they can show you what not to do and shave years off of your life. Now, Carrie sounds like a very giving, generous guy, uh, but how are you able to uh, maintain that mentorship? Because you know how it is, you know, if all you're doing is taking, eventually that person peters out and it's no longer a mentorship yeah. because it's a two-way street. Yeah. Uh, I, I think he he tells me that he learns a lot from me. 
he knows so much that I don't feel like I could teach this man anything. But I think one of the greatest things you can do to, I guess, hold on to a mentor is actually show them that you're doing, that you're actually taking their advice and putting action to their advice. I, I can't actually, I actually take that back. You don't need to, to offer anything to uh, a mentor. If your mentor is successful and they know what it takes to be successful, I've never met a successful person who isn't willing to help, to help somebody who's just as hungry as they were. Hmm. So I would say if you're taking action, if, if, if you ask your mentor something, do it, follow through and let them know that you do it and thank them. I don't think enough people do that last part. Uh, sure. Yeah, I, I don't like giving people advice if they're not going to follow through with it. Yeah, uh, absolutely. But if any speaker or anybody who's come to me like, Cam, I want to get started. Yeah, I'll give you a few things. I'm not going to give you too much of my time, but I'll give you a few things that I think you should do. And if you come back to me and that's done, I am sold. You have me. Anything you need, any information, I'll give it for free because I am nothing but the product of a lot of help from a lot of people. And my way of giving forward is to help someone else. And I believe every successful person has that. And I don't have the, the famine mentality that like there's enough for everyone. I believe there's enough gigs for everyone. There's enough money for everyone to go around. There's enough opportunities for everyone to be successful. Yeah, absolutely. That's great, man. Yeah. So just do, do the thing that you said you were going to do. I'm, I'm quoting Shia LaBeau. <laughs> I don't yeah. know if you've seen do that. it. <laughs> do it. <laughs> Oh man, that's a great one. Very cool, man. So Cam, uh, tell me what you're up to. Let's talk about your goals. I just think everybody wants to know what you're, what you got planned for the rest of uh, 2019 and 2020. What are you working on? Uh, how can, how can people support you? And just, I just want to hear the cool stuff you're doing. So right now for me, what I've done is uh, I've created an online course to teach athletes how to supplement their income on their own schedule to allow them financial freedom as they chase their goals, uh, whether it's college basketball or, or the Olympics, because a lot of people don't realize athletes don't make a lot of money. There's some athletes who make a lot of money, but like Olympic level athletes and like a professional bowler, they're, they'll probably have a, a full-time job too. And I believe that the traits it takes to be successful in sports are paralleled in every industry in life and in any avenue in life. And I believe that athletes have the insight and the character traits it takes to become successful. And I'm teaching them how to use their story to leverage it to teach other people. So I named the course Mission AU79, which is the atomic symbol for gold. And oh, yeah. so Mission Gold. And uh, yeah, I'm releasing it December 1st. It's going to be a, a 12 part course. And in that course will be uh, there's workbooks and for your fill out. There's uh, gives every detail of starting a speaking business from scratch, how to create an LLC, how to create a speech, how to come up with content, how to build an online presence, how to establish yourself as an expert, the technology apps and things you'll need to purchase, how to acquire quality video for your presentation basically everything you need to do to build a successful speaking business. Uh, so I've uh, been working on that course and officially finished with that, be released December 1st. Also, I started a reusable telescopic straw company. Nice. Uh, yeah, it's uh, called Sucker Duckers. Nice. Is that suck, suck it up or Sucker Duck? Oh. Uh, sucker Duckers, S-U-C-K-A. D U C K A. Yes. Okay, nice. Okay. Yeah. So the term sucker duckers, like where you wear sunglasses and a hat to like duck the suckers, mm -hmm. uh, that's a term they used like back in the days. And I just reuse that term because uh, avoiding suckers, avoiding straws, sucker duckers. And it helps with the environment. But also, every school that books me, uh, I give them a special link to sell online. Uh, so they can share it with their students and their teachers and every straw they purchase, I donate $5 to that school. Nice. So it's a way to, it's not so much for me to make money through selling straws. It's for schools to do fundraising and for me to be on the school's radars at all time. Yeah, Just man, that's right. Different ways to leverage myself. 
Yeah, no, that's a great idea. And I, I sh- I'm sure they appreciate the extra money that uh, will be coming in for it. That's awesome. And also, you're going to do this little thing called, you know, getting in the Olympics. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the little thing. Oh, that's amazing, man. Well, I'll, I will make sure that I know exactly when you're going to be fighting. Are you in, by the way? or? Uh, I won the uh, Olympic trials in Trinidad. I still have to qualify in the Americas tournament in March. Now, uh, I'll be posting about that. But just until then, my, my goal is to, my goal for January is to do at least one speaking engage, engagement every school day in, in January while maintaining like working out and training and all that. So I'll have to fund my, fund my trip to the Olympics. So it's going to be a little costly, but worth it. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, yeah, man, you'll just be, you know, inspiring people with your story and yeah, it's, it's just, uh, it's really cool to see you on that journey. And of course you have that Netflix special <laughs> little thing called the Netflix special that, uh, we didn't bring into the fray, but there's that too. Yeah. Um, there's two of them. There's a uh, counterpunch and destination team USA. It's the second uh, documentary on Netflix. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Who's counting? Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, you know. Also, uh, also from the ground up on iTunes, but wow, who counts? Oh, nice. <laughs> Goodness gracious. <laughs> he, he's on like everything, you know, just whatever. Um, that's awesome, man. Very cool. Um, sweet. Well, um, we're getting close to the end of the interview. Uh, is there any final thought that you want to share that you feel like uh, we didn't talk about during the interview, but you're just like, man, you know what, this is something that people, young people need to hear. I think for what I think young people need to know is the only reason a lot of people follow trends and they follow what's successful. And the only reason why something is successful is because someone tried it for the first time. Now, you can be someone who fits into the mold and does what someone else did to be successful, but you'll never be as successful as they are because you're just a duplicate. But everything had become successful the first time because someone had to try something new. So step out of the box, take different approaches. And even if you look like an idiot when you fail, I'd much rather look like an idiot failing than be unaccomplished in life because of the fair failure. So think think outside the box. No, that's awesome, man. That's, you know what, that is a a perfect way to uh, wrap up that, uh, all the good things that you were just dropping. Very cool, man. All right, Cam. Well, we are pretty much at the end of it. I am going to go ahead and uh, do this little thing called freestyle rapping. The kids seem to like it. Uh, So I'll just uh, talk about the things that we talked about and uh, see where it goes. All right. Check. Yo. Check me. I'm just bossing. Cam F. Awesome. Doing a bunch of things. Chilling in the ring against the ropes. But he keeps on swinging, and that's what he says. Motivation bringing all the freaking time. He's up on the stage and up in a rage, but he's busting the jokes. Really quite dope. He got you with the right hook. That is the freaking opener. Yo, I'm just dope with wood. Spitting freestyles, talking about work. You got to put in at work all the freaking time. Blood, sweat, and tears. Whole bunch of fears that you got to overcome. You got to run. Harder than the next man, that's what you gotta do. Yo, I just drop a few rhymes all the time. Talk about things, you gotta persevere. Gotta be resilient up in here. I'm talking to my dude right freaking now. Changed his name, but didn't change the game. He just keeps it inspirational all the freaking time. Come right now, and yo, I just rhyme. I'm talking about the things that you gotta do. Step out the box and think outside it. You are just arriving if you keep going. And that's what I say. You got to keep showing yourself what you could do all the freaking time. And that's what I do. I come through and find the comfort zone. I got to get out, not leave it alone. But yo, I just shown skills all the time. And that's how I go. Spit freestyles up in the flow. Spit off the top. And that's how I go. And that's what I said with a camp F flow. Hey, you, did, you end every show like that? Oh, yes. Got, got to end the shows like that, man. You know, that's dope. got to go for it, man. Just uh, it's, uh, it's it's just something I do that that makes people happy. And if nothing else, it makes myself happy. And there we are. But um, awesome, man. Thanks for having me on.
Yeah, absolutely. So, Cam, uh, I wish you nothing but the uh, utmost success with everything that you're doing. I want I want you to go ahead and just share your social medias with the audience. So where can people find you, follow you, book you to speak, the whole nine? All right. Uh, you can find me at camfawesome.com or camfawesome, C-A-M-F-A-W-E-S-O-M-E on all social media channels, uh, Snapchat, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and also, I don't know, probably Craigslist Misconnections. You never know. <laughs> nice. Oh, man. Yeah, that, that's uh, – <laughs> people are looking for you. They're just like, hey, man, who's that uh, inspirational vegan guy who uh, yeah. <laughs> could destroy me <laughs> but was very <laughs> kind and hilarious? <laughs> Where are you, man? Who's that passive-aggressive vegan? <laughs> vegan yeah. boxer. Yeah, you're you're just uh you're you're like in every major city that you speak at. They're just like, well, <laughs> yeah, that's awesome, man. Very cool. All right, well, I'll make sure to tag all of that in the show notes. Cam, thank you so much for just dropping your knowledge. Thank you so much for uh, just being an inspiration. And uh, yeah, man, I'm, I'm just I'm so happy to have you on, and I know that uh, everybody will enjoy your stuff. So um, yeah, man. Until next time, I, I'd actually like to interview after. Uh, uh, after some of these things roll, just to kind of get a catch up. Awesome. For sure, man. All right. Have a good day, man. You too. Take care. <laughs>